That was Connor's request back here. And I've been singing that song all week long. We're going to sing it again, though. Any the whole thing. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. It's camp meeting time. Let's have a camp meeting. Good morning. Everybody that's out there in... They used to call it radio land. Radio's not even in the picture anymore, hardly. But we're thankful for the privilege we have this morning to be here, to begin this camp meeting, and there's lots more people coming in, and God bless them and protect them as they come. What a wonderful time we can have if we just let loose and let God have his way in our hearts. We're going to sing a song that most of you know this morning. It's page 354. I want you to stand, please. You still got your books, I hope. 354, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. <laughs> sing it. You know... People brighten up. We talked about this this morning. There's so much unmusic that goes forth in the house of God or the church. And somebody hears amazing grace. Or God will take care of you. Or some other song that's been sung for... 200 years and never worn out. That's what we sing around here. I hope you enjoy it. Sing it. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior Oh 
standing, please. Amen. A phrase that they sang in this song, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. He holdeth me up. Everything around us is sinking sand. Yeah. Amen. But he holdeth us up. And that just blessed my soul. How many of you have been held up this week? Not with a gun, but with grace. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank God for. And it's becoming a wonderful and a rare privilege to have camp meeting. They're playing out. And there's a lot of people trying to put the fire out in this country. But greater is he that's in us Amen. than all those that are in the world. Glory be to God. Yes, praise God. <clears throat> I just want to make a special mention, folks we haven't seen forever. This one down here in the green and yellow has been doing all the shouting is Jolene Duke from Oklahoma. I see the stampers back there, Stephanie, God bless you. Danny Talbot and Harley. The Webbs, the Morrises. The whole yes, that's right. I, I can't start naming. I'll forget to. <clears throat> oh, it's a wonderful time of the year when the saints can get together for camp meeting and we get to see people we hadn't seen for a year or maybe in Danny's case, uh, Talbot. And what, 40 years, Danny? 31. You can tell he's a professor. 31 years since we've seen him and Arlene. You look great. Good to see you. God bless each and every one of you. A prayer request just came in. Uh, this is from Connie Klein in uh, Hagerstown area. And she says that her oldest granddaughter, Reagan, uh, is expecting her first child mid-July and there are heart issues. So she will be delivering at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. She asked that we would really pray. Uh, Connie Klein, you probably would recognize or remember her. Her husband, every time he walked in the front door, he had cowboy boots on and a cowboy hat. Yeah. And he was a good old boy. He went on to be with the Lord. Oh, thank God. We've got some uh, prayer requests. Jack Emery. Uh, has a couple things going on. He fell, broke his arms, got some other issues. He's hoping to join us in a couple days. Danny Lane <clears throat> has uh, UTI, a serious infection. Want to remember him in prayer. Sister Bounds just got out of the hospital. Sister Lewis, who has the leukemia, she had a uh, bone marrow biopsy last Wednesday. 
and she's going to get the results the first of the week and uh, find out uh, whether they're going to go ahead with the procedure or not. Uh, Betty Quick's daughter uh, passed away, has cancer. Uh, there are several other requests. There are unspoken requests. So I'm going to take your burdens by an upraised hand. It's good to see each and every one of you. As you know, we are trying to comply uh, with uh, all the uh, social distancing. And I thought the balcony was going to be for social distancing, but they don't look like a social distancing crowd up there. <laughs> but anyway, this whole section is, and we can put chairs out around. Uh, the choir, as you can see, are socially distancing. The dining hall tables are all set apart. And uh, we're doing everything we can to keep both sides happy. Amen? All right. God bless you. It's so good to see each and every one of you. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Our speaker down here is Brad Epperson. Raise your hand, Brad. And he's pastor of the Church of God. Is it Stanton, Kentucky? Oh, in Clay City. You're, okay, you're right there with Brother Kelly. Okay. And these are his boys, Brad and Caleb. So we're glad to have them with it. No, not Brad. Caleb and Seth. Right? Hey, you got to give me credit. I'm 76 years old, and I can remember most of your names now. All right. God bless you. We're going to look to the Lord, and um, let's ask Brother Bob to come and lead us in prayer. And it is truly good to see all of you. I'm thankful when Jesus was talking to his disciples they thought he was going to set up a kingdom here on earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is in the hearts of men. Thank God. And I'm glad that Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Thank God. Nobody can read our hearts. Only our Lord Jesus Christ that I'm so thankful. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning. We have this great privilege of coming together, Lord, as the church of the living God. Thank you, Father, for your mercies that you've seen fit, Lord, to bring us all together. And God, we prayed for those that are, were on their way, Father, for the last couple of days, not knowing where they were coming from, but God, that your hand would rest upon them and protect them, God. And we thank you, Father, that each one has come in safely, God. And Father, this morning as we look to you, God, we look to you, Father, that, Lord, you would bring together what is needed to bless and strengthen our souls, God. And, and Heavenly Father, that you would look upon all of these requests of prayer that's been made. Lord, only you know the homes, God, where death has entered. The homes, Lord, where there's sickness, God. The requests that have been made, Father, and sent in. Lord, you know. Father in heaven, we pray that your kindness be upon them. Lord, our prayer's been for months, Lord, that you would protect your people from this terrible virus thing, Father. We thank you, God, that you're almighty and you're able, Father, to do so and to keep us, Lord. Even though we come together, God, we know, Father, that you're able to deliver us, Lord, from all of the problems, the situations, the sicknesses, Lord, the viruses, Father. We thank you, God, you're greater than all of them, Lord. And Father, we ask your blessings upon this, this people today, God. May your spirit, Lord, so move upon the hearts of each one. You know, ones have come, Lord, hungry for the things of God. We pray, Lord, that you'll fill their souls, Lord. Uh, during this camp meeting, Father, that great encouragement, God, will come upon your people, Father. Lord, that you would feed the souls of those that have been so hungry, God. 
Bless the lives, Lord, of those that have given their lives unto you. And Father, they be ones among us, Lord, that aren't saved. We ask you, God, you'll move upon their souls, Father. My God, do the miracle in their hearts, God, to make them a new creature in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that old things pass away. All things become new in you, Father. We thank you, God, for the miracle of salvation, Father. How great we've seen that work over the many years, Lord, and how many lives we've seen changed. Lord, we look to you once again. Again, Father, pray you'll move upon our midst, God, and throughout this meeting, Lord, that great things be accomplished for the kingdom of God. Bless, Lord, the choir today. Bless the special singers. Bless our dear brothers. He stands before us, Lord, to declare the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, God, that you'll give to him freely the thoughts, Lord, and the understanding, God, and the wisdom to bring forth your word, Father. Lord, we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Savior, and amen.
born as a beggar, unwanted and surely unclean, despised by the folks who all knew me, who would cringe at the sound of my Testing, testing. I was born as a beggar, unwanted and surely unclean. Despised by the folks who all knew me, who would cringe at the sound of my name. Then I met a man they called Jesus, and he offered my soul everything in love took me in and he bought all my sins now i live in the house of a king i don't dwell in a shack near life's railroad i a tree takes leaves in the spring. Now my days are all blessed and my nights filled with rest and I live in the house of a king. I don't dwell in a shack near life's railroad.
good place to live. Best place to live. Only thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Turn to 334 while we take our morning offerings. All the way. All the way, my Savior leads me. Oh, am I to ask me sign? Oh, my doubt is tender. have a trio, mixed trio to sing before the message this morning. God bless them. How many here this morning can say God has been good to you? How many can say God has done something for you just in the past couple days, just in the past week, just in the last 24 hours? I know for me, it's been a crazy week leading up to camp meeting. It seems to always go that way, doesn't it? The devil tries his best to knock us down when we're getting ready to go into a spiritual blessing. And I ran by this song, it's been a while ago, but it simply just says, Lord, we come to bless your holy name. And that's what I want to do today Amen. and this week and all through my life is to bless his holy name for all the things that he has done for me. For all the prayers that he's answered. He's such a faithful God. Amen. And when I, I want to tell everybody that I can about him. You pray that I can get through this song. I hope it's a blessing to you. I could ask you for a miracle, you know I stand in need. 
I could seek your hand to move and touch my family. But I push aside these temporary trials that I face. Lord, I just want to bless you with my praise. Lord, I come, come to bless your holy name again. Just once more before I say amen. You're my Jesus, my my Savior and my friend, Lord, I come to bless your holy name again. I could never count the many ways you've made my life complete. Amen. Lord, your mercy is the reason why my spirit sings. Though my words could never fully tell the story of your grace, I just want to rest in your embrace and lord i come to bless your holy name again just once more before i say Brother Epperson, uh, as he said, he's the pastor of the Church of God in Clay City, Kentucky, and we're glad to have him and his sons. This is his first time here. Um, he, uh, he ran around with Robbie Spencer a good part of his life. He preached Robbie's funeral, and I've gotten to know him through the camp meeting there in Campbellsville, and he's, uh, he's a jewel. So let's receive him with a good amen. amen. What a thrilling place it is to be here this morning. He thundered forth. All right, that's a good start. All right. 
What a good place to be this morning. It is so exciting to get to come and, and humbling also to be asked to preach to this storied camp meeting today. And I want to thank Brother Bartlett for the invitation. And I could also say that it is uh, quite an experience to come and preach when it's this mandate is written on the wall behind me. Preach the word. Preach the word. I feel like there's a grand finger somewhere being pointed at me. Preach the word. So be it. But if that be the case, can I say to you that it is not pointed at me only, but it's pointed at all of us. Every one of us is commissioned of God to preach the word of the Lord in this generation. Amen. The kerygma, the proclamation of the gospel belongs not only to the pulpit, but to the whole church. And I hope you understand that if I'm under the gun, so are you today. I was thinking about those words, preach the word. Joe Stoll, who was the president of the Moody Bible Institute, remembered that when he was a child, his father was a pastor of the church that they attended. And on the pulpit, he had just tacked a little sign there, handwritten, nobody else ever saw it, but his father and anybody else who happened to stand behind the pulpit. And it was that little verse of scripture where some men had come to one of the disciples and that verse says, Sir, we would see Jesus. And he put that there so that he was reminded every time that he came to the pulpit that his, his mandate at that mo moment was not for anything personal of his own, but it was to be God's man bringing the Son of God to the world. And friend, that belongs to me and you as well. Let me just begin with a quick reading from the book of Isaiah. If you'd like to turn with me there, I'm going to read from Isaiah, the first three verses of the 60th chapter, Isaiah 60 verses one through three. And this is what the word of God says here. It says, arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. Hallelujah. And his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Could I indulge in one more moment of prayer? Our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the words of Scripture, for these verses and for all the holy book. God, I pray today that you would give me a visitation of the Spirit to be able to preach what is on not my heart, but on the heart of God today. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray for that. Amen and amen. I do want to tell you that I come to you with a sense of urgency, and so I'm going to do my best to just get right to it this morning. I have a sense of urgency about the message that I have for you. I know that in most pulpits across the country, most preachers have been talking about the days that we're living in and how strange they are. Well, they are strange days. The days that we've witnessed in this last half a year have certainly been odd. They've been different. I found myself before the throne of the sovereign God just asking Him for the wisdom to even know how to think about the days that we're living through. Did you know that what we need in these days is not the wisdom of man, but it's the wisdom of God? We need the wisdom of God. We need men and women who are, who are trained in their thinking by the Holy Spirit Himself. The Scripture tells me that at the coronation of King David, after all those years of waiting while Saul was king, him knowing that he was anointed to be the king over Israel, but he was waiting on God's time. When the moment finally came and David was at Hebron and was being uh, crowned, he'd been anointed years before, but now being crowned as king of Israel, all the tribes sent representatives to crown him as king. And over in the book of 1 Chronicles, I won't read that whole passage to you, but if you'd like to read in chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles, You'll see about all those that came and it says from this tribe, all these mighty men of war, all these warriors, all these stout hearted men, it says in one place that they came from another tribe. It says from the half tribe of Manasseh, there were so many who came commissioned of their tribe to come and make David king. Mighty men, men of valor, men of strength. Listen to what it also says in the 32nd verse of 1 Chronicles 12. It says, of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times. 
to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Did you hear what that was saying there? That was saying that in the middle of all the strength that was needed and the need for men of war, for men of valor, for men of stout hearts, that there was also a need. And God saw to the need by sending those who had understanding of the times that they were living in. I think, friend, that the moment has come now where we're going to need those that have understanding of the times that we're living in. I think we need those that are endued with this Issacharian wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. We know it need those with a keen perception of the times. Born out of time spent with the Holy Ghost, shutting out the noise of the world. And I want you to hear that again. They get that perception from time spent with the Holy Spirit in the throne room, shutting out the noise of the world. Friend, there's our failure very often. We have forgotten how to shut out the noise of the world. We need this wisdom because of one thing. We need this wisdom because of the darkness. In Isaiah 60, we were reading about how the darkness covered the land and deep darkness covered all the people. And there was a need in that moment for light to come. Can I say to you that we're in need of wisdom and light to come from God. And it is because of the darkness that we need these things. Amen. We need that Wisdom and that light, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people It said in verse 2. Well, what about this darkness anyway? In a matter of weeks, we watched a virus emerge from a far corner of the world and become a global pandemic. Think about all the ways that the world has changed just in the last few months. Could you have imagined a year ago when you were in camp meeting that this year when it came, you'd be telling people not to get close to each other, shake hands or hug each other, but to be distant from one another. Can you imagine? Think about how our just daily interactions with people have changed in just the last few months. Even, even six or seven months ago, we could not have even imagined the things that we've seen happen in that. Talking about how we're going to have our kids going back to school this fall and all the things that are going to be a challenge there. I don't know how they're going to make it work. And yet the darkness, hear me now, and yet the darkness I'm talking about is more than a virus. We're living under the threat of economic collapse in our days. Global markets are reeling and supply chains are disrupted. Unemployment rates are staggering in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I can't remember the statistic of how many people are now uh, applying for unemployment insurance. It is unprecedented. Nobody remembers ever seeing anything like that. Our nation has gone trillions of dollars deeper into debt. And I don't know what the ultimate ramifications of that will be. And yet, the darkness that I'm talking about is more than economical. Racial tensions are tearing at the fabric of our society. We're divided along class lines, along educational lines, along geographical lines. Political differences are pulling us apart in the nation that we live in. All these things are, 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 are terrible. They're Truths behind these things that need to be grappled with, that need to be wrestled with. We need to get down to the wisdom of God and all these things. We're being divided into even to ever smaller groups until finally, if that is left unchecked, it will be every man against his neighbor. And yet the darkness that I'm talking about this morning is more than a divided society. It's more than arguments. It's more than tensions. It's bigger than that even. The deep darkness that covers the earth today is a spiritual darkness. Did you know that? The deep darkness that covers the earth today is a spiritual darkness. And I want to explain to you why that is. Why we are where we are. A number of years ago, our culture set a course for something. Our whole culture set a course determined a path and started down that path. And we're finally getting there. 
We're finally arriving at where all the social engineers have been trying to get us to. The only problem is that the landscape now that we've gotten here is not the paradise they were promising us, but it's bleak and it's barren and it's dark. Turns out it isn't heaven on earth. It's more like hell on earth, isn't it? This is the darkness that we're living in. We're living in a, we're living in a secularized world. I don't know if you've heard that term before. You probably have, but let me talk about it for just a moment. We're living in a secularized world. And secularization, I'm going to borrow, borrow Robbie Zacharias' definition here. He said secularization is the process by which spiritual or religious ideas, values, and institutions lose their relevance to the broader culture. Right? Right? That is the course that our culture set a long time ago, several decades ago. We determined that we were going to become secularized. And we've tried our best, or, or we've tried, I don't know if we've tried our best as the church, but we've at least given it a half-hearted effort to put the brakes on that. Maybe that would have gotten an amen, I don't know, but that's all right. Uh, but the truth is that we're finally seeing ourselves as a culture get there. We watched it happen in Europe over the last couple of decades. We watched those things happen there and we thought, well, that'll never really happen here. We saw it in far off places like Australia, cultures that have become entirely secular. And we thought, well, American people are different than that. They were different then, but are they different now? As a whole, they are not. And as a matter of fact, I believe that we finally have fully become a secularized culture. And this darkness, this diseased rot is pervasive. We're now having to harvest the terrible crop that we have sown in these things. We see the impact most clearly. And I want to say this to you. I want you to hear this. We see the impact of those things most clearly on the generation that is just coming of age now. My sons are with me today. They're 14 and they're 15, now, well, they'll be 14 and 15 in a little less than a month. I'll be getting there. A little over a month. I better say that or they will correct me here in front of everybody. Uh, about to be 14 and 15. They're part of the generation that I'm talking about. A few a little older than them. But I want you to hear that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking today because as a Christian, I'm concerned. As a father, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about those things. More than any other American generation, they've been deprived of a spiritual foundation. You see, we've lived through, our, our culture has come through pandemic before, right? Our culture has come through uh, economic collapse before. Our culture has survived through division before, but this is different now. And the reason it's different now is that we have put ourselves in a position where there's so little spiritual foundation to deal with these things from. Amen. And so we have this generation coming on that's been deprived of a spiritual foundation. Now, without my glasses, if I take my glasses off, you people have just become vague forms to me. <laughs> You see, if, if you take away my, my glasses, I have trouble making any sense out of the world at all. There's none of you close enough to me that I could recognize you. Not even my own boys over there that I can recognize you without. I have to have these to be able to see. Without these lenses, I can't make sense of the world. The generation that's coming on now has no lens by which to make sense of the world around them. And it's costing them something dearly. Let me give you just a few statistics. I got these off the internet from trustworthy sources. You could find the same things within the first 15 years or so of this century. To me, that seems like just the other day to my kids. That goes back a while. But the first 15 years of the, from, from, from 2000 to about 2015 or 16, the rate of suicide increased by 30%. So suicide increased by 30%. It's the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24-year-olds. It's the fourth lead. Listen to this. It's the fourth leading cause of death for 10 to 14-year-olds. Why are we talking about something like that? A 10-year-old having any relevance to a suicide statistic. Why does that even ever fall into conversation to have to think about those things? The National Institute of Mental Health 
In their study, they say that 31.9%, that's almost one in three, 31.9% of American teens suffer from some kind of clinically diagnosable anxiety disorder. Mental health disorders among the young have more than doubled in the last decade. 3.2 million, listen to this, 3.2 million teens in America between the ages of 12 and 17 had a major depressive episode. That is not, they got a little down over a breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend. They had a major depressive episode at some point in the last 12 months. 3.2 million teens. Let me ask you, what do you think is driving that? What's causing all those things to happen? We, we can come up with some, some answers that come right off the cuff and they're easy to say, but I'm not sure they really give the right picture. Somebody says, I know it's them video games. Playing too many videos, watching too much TV. They got them screens in front of them all the time. Frank, can I say to you that that's just too easy to say, but that doesn't even begin to touch what the real darkness is. That's not really even beginning to get down down to that. It's not that they don't just have enough chores to do right now. The real answer is that it's the darkness assaulting minds that have nothing solid with which to answer back. I'm going to say that one more time. It's, It's that the darkness is assaulting minds that have nothing solid with which to answer back because we've given them nothing. We've given them no answer to give back. I've got a niece, my brother's daughter, I love her dearly. She's about to turn 20 years old. I called her the other day and I said, Delaney, I want to go hiking. I enjoy hiking in Red River Gorge. I don't like going alone because I'm carrying too much weight and I feel like I could get down out there. You know what I'm saying? I want a teenager with me to help me if I need it. So I called my niece. I said, Delaney, I'm going hiking. You want to go? She said, I'll be right there. I'm ready. Let's go. And so we went on a little hike out through the Red River Gorge, enjoyed that. And on the way back, we got to talking, and it was just a nice chance to connect with her. Now, now my niece didn't, uh, my niece doesn't exactly share my worldview in a lot of things. She wasn't raised to. But as we were riding along, she said something to me. She said, you know, my friend Allie and I were talking about you the other day. And I said, oh, really? And she said, We said that we envy you that you're able to believe so strongly in something. We envy you that you're able to believe so strongly in something. As I ponder that, I think what she really meant to say without knowing it, I think what she really meant to say is that we envy you that you have something to believe in. And that's a little bit different, but the difference makes a lot of difference. We envy you that you have something to believe in. And I said, all right, well, let's talk about that. Got a little while to drive to get back from here. Let's go ahead and discuss that. What, what do you mean? What are you talking about like that? I said, what do you, what do you believe in? And she just kind of mumbled a few things, but it never really kind of cohered around in it. I said, Delaney, I'll tell you what, let me just ask you a few questions and you answer them however it seems right to you too. And that way I'm really understanding where you're coming from. I said, let's just borrow a few questions from somewhere and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them of you and you, you tell me what you think. I said, I said, how do you think you got here? And I don't mean in this truck with me today riding back from hiking. I mean, how do you think you arrived on this planet? What do you think it is that brought you into being? And she gave me, and, I, and you know what? Here's the thing. If, if I get angry at her for answering me with what she's been taught, I am in the wrong. Now, her answer was useless. It was terrible. But she was giving me what she'd been fed. She was giving back to me what she's been given every day of her life. And I can't be angry at her. I can be mad as I can be at the darkness. But I can't get angry at her for it. And she said, you know, I don't really think that, that, I mean, it's just, you know, random realities of universe exploded into existence and these things just came about by chance and time and you know here we are i said so you're telling me that you come from from random mindless natural forces that had no design no intent no creative power within them beyond just explosiveness and she said yeah i guess that's what i believe and i said okay all right i said that's an honest answer and i'll have to accept that but you have to accept something along with that 
that what you believe will always cost you something. What I believe has to cost me something, right? When we believe a thing, when we build our life around what we believe, there are going to be some innate cost to it. And I wasn't talking to her even yet then about, about eternity and eternal things. I mean the fact that what you believe in this life is going to cost you something. I said, all right, now, now here's the thing. I've got three more questions or four that I'm going to ask you after that. But everything you tell me now is built on that foundation that you just gave me. You told me that you come from nothing but random chance. Now, your next answer has to build on that because it becomes cohesive. It has to be cohesive within itself. She said, why is that? I said, because when you're talking to me, you want me to give you coherent answers. You have to give me some coherent answers. And I said, now, here's my next question. The second question I have is, what is your purpose? What is your purpose? What gives your life any sense of purpose? And she said, well, gee, I don't know. I don't know, maybe it's just whatever I decide that it should be. I get to determine my own purpose. I said, man, that's shaky ground because there's a question that's just a twin of that one. It's deeply connected to it. And here's my question to you after that. What is it that gives you value? And she didn't like where that left her. She came from nothing as a product of random mindless chance. Scattered over eons happening and she came to be as just a blip for a moment on the radar of time. Right? I said, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's awfully hard to find any, any lasting purpose in that. Right? And when you don't find any purpose, it's hard to know why you have any real value at all. Right? Right? I told her about a conversation I had with my older boy one time when I was driving a school bus. I used to, that was my tent making profession. I was a school bus driver. I like to say it was a good job because all my problems were behind me then. Uh, but, I, uh, but I remember one day I was, I was pulling into my house, uh, backing into my driveway from that school bus. All those kids were, bless God, they were all unloaded. <laughs> they were all at home at their house. And uh, as I was backing in, my boy was about five, six years old then, and and he had seen me coming, and I guess he'd gotten away from his mama. He ran out the door to come and meet me on the school bus, right? Right? And uh, he, comes, he comes running out the door, and I just happened to catch a glimpse of him in the mirror of that school bus as I was still in the mo middle of backing it up. And I see him appear at the side of it, and I tell you, I was instantaneous on applying the brakes. And I opened the door, and I hollered at him. I said, come on up here. Let's talk for just a minute. And I said, son, listen here. I said, I said, this school bus I'm driving, it doesn't have any mind about it at all. It doesn't have any means by which to differentiate between you and one of the rocks in our driveway. It'll run over you just as quick as it'll run over one of them and think absolutely nothing about snuffing out your life, right? It'll, it'll squelch you out like that and think nothing about it. I said, but now here's the advantage you have. Here's the one thing that you had that was working in your favor. The one thing that you had that was working in your favor is that your father was driving this bus. And I love you. And I know the difference between you and a mindless rock. I know the difference between you and something that can be run over without thinking about it at all. Aren't you glad you have a father driving the bus? And I told that story to my niece. And I said, do you want to put your life, your very self, before a bus and nobody driving it? How much better is it when you, when you know that there's a holy God who created you for His purposes and He loves you and He intends to do wonderful things in your life? How much better is that? She said, well, I get that a little bit. I guess I begin to understand that. But she kept, the more we talked, the more she kept trying to piece it together to make it work with her original premise intact. And I said, all right, here's my next question then. My next question is this. How do you know what you should do or what you should not do? Let's talk about morality. Everybody's got their own version of morality, I guess. But you tell me where yours comes from. And she said, well, i tell you what. She said, I think this is a place where we're going to differ. I said, well, we've already found those. And she said, but here's where my morality. She said, I just feel like I just, I just do what seems right to me. <laughs> Uh-oh, isn't there? Indeed. I just do what I just try to be a good person. I say, well, first of all, you don't have any, you, you, you've given me no basis by which to even define that term good, what that means. That's a useless word at this point from your worldview, right? 
I said, but, but here's the thing. I said, I said, so you say I'm just going to do my own thing and hope. But I said, you'll never be able to resist the temptation. And the temptation you won't be able to resist is that somebody, someday you're going to look at somebody else and you're going to say to them, you know what you should be doing or you know what you should not be doing. And at that point, you're, uh, you're imposing your morality that you have admitted you just came up with on your own. And you're saying to them, you got to live it my way. And I said, and I think that somewhere behind this is what you think I'm guilty of doing to you. Right? Only I'm not telling you that I wrote this thing for myself. I'm telling you that I know where I came from. I know why I'm here. I understand the origin of my life. And that makes me understand the purpose of my life. And born out of that origin and born out of that purpose, that gives me an understanding in of, of the kind of man I ought to be. It's at least the foundation for morality for me to say, I should do this. I shouldn't do that. Right? And then finally, I asked her that fourth question. I said, and where are you going to when this is all over with? She said, I guess I'm going home, right? We're heading that way. I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about then. I'm talking about at the very end. What are you, what are you going to do? What happens to you? And she said, I guess I just die. I guess I just die. And that's, and that's, that's it then, isn't it? I mean, isn't it over with then? Right? I said, so here's what you're telling me. You're telling me that you come from nothing. And that you're on your way to nothing with no value giving purpose and no real idea what you should be doing with yourself while you're here. It's all relativism with no fixed landmark. Right. Remember all those statistics I gave to you? 30 percent rise in suicide. 3.2 million 12 to 17 year olds having major depressive episodes. One in three having a clinically diagnosable anxiety disorder. Doubling the rate of all categories of mental illness among the young generation. I'm asking you again, what's driving it, friend? It's more than video games. Can I tell you that what is driving that is the darkness of the times that we're living in? We have left a generation with no spiritual foundation. And they are groping in the dark for something to hold on to. For something to hold on to. They're killing themselves. And when they're not killing themselves outright, so many of them, I mean, they're following Things that are highly destructive. I don't drive a school bus anymore. One of the things that I do on the side, though, is I work for a funeral home. And our funeral director is also the coroner in our hometown there. I was in there the other day helping her deputy coroner. He had gone out to pick up a, a, a guy. He is, uh, bless his heart. I mean, it's awful. Found him with his needle in his arm. His buddy called him and said, I think there's something wrong with my friend. It was. He was dead. He was dead. So, Deputy Coroner went out and took his stretcher and picked him up. Realized after he left, he said, I, I left the guy's wallet there. He had to get his wallet with his identifying stuff and his, all his things. He had to bring that. He said, I realized I had left his wallet behind. And he said, I turned around and said, I'd been gone maybe five, maybe ten minutes. I don't know. He said, I got back to the house, went in the door, and his buddy... His buddy that called me to come get him because he thought there was something wrong with his friend watched me load him on a stretcher and haul him out to go back to the funeral home with him. He was bent over the coffee table snorting lines. He said, I just, I just loaded the guy. And here, what's going on there? What's going on there? Absolute lack of foundation. No idea of what to build on. No idea of what to do with oneself. And it always, always seems to lend itself toward destruction. Something to believe in indeed. Here's the thing. I didn't just come here to give you grim statistics about the world that we're living in. I, I hope that somewhere we can get down some, to some gospel good news in this. So here's the real thing that I want to say to you. The more time that I spend praying about this as a pastor, as a man who has to live through these days that we're living in, and especially also as a father of sons growing up in this generation, I want you to know that this is much on my mind in prayer. And the more time that I spend with the Holy Spirit, the more time I spend before the throne, the more I become convinced that we may be, we may be nearing one of those but God moments. A but God moment. I want to bring you back to one of those moments. Paul preaching in the book of Acts to a, a, a group of people in Pisidian Antioch. He was witness, witnessing there. And in that, in that story that he tells, he goes on recounting all these works of God and how they finally came down 
to this moment when God Himself put on human flesh and came into the world. He said, but then, then when it seemed like things were going really good, then all of a sudden the story, story took a negative turn and they came and they accused Him of all kinds of things. They told lies about Him. They took Him with lawless hands. They hung Him on a cross. When He was dead, they took Him down from the tree and they laid His body in a tomb. Right? And then Paul said, but God raised Him from the dead. Hallelujah. God inserted a but God moment in the middle of deep darkness. God is good at that. Amen. And he would go on to say, we declare to you glad tidings. That promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled. Preach the word indeed, it says. That is on all of us. The kerygma, the proclamation of the gospel. The world is stumbling in darkness and they are in such terribly great need of it. But I really believe in my spirit that God intends to bring us to a but God moment. I believe we're, I believe we're at a key moment for what is sometimes called an awakening. An awakening. Hear me now. We look back through history and we see times, not just a revival. We'll talk about revival in a moment. But can I talk to you that, that there have been some key places in the history of the world where it was more than revival, it was an awakening. You see, a revival is what happens in God's church. An awakening is what happens when an entire culture is impacted with the truth and finds its ground again underneath its feet. I believe that God is intending to bring us to a, a but God awakening moment. I believe that the generation that we're looking at now, this generation is going to begin demanding those things that they've been deprived of. Do you believe that or do you not? Because I can, I, I'll tell you, I believe that a person can only take so much darkness. Anybody else like me kind of solar powered? I mean, three or four days in a row of gray, drizzly weather, and I start to drain out pretty quick. You know what I'm saying? Just, just, just need a little light, you know? I mean, God, send me one little ray of sunshine. Part the cloud, let me look at one little patch of blue, and I'm good, but I just need to see that, right? What happens? I think there's such a thing as dark fatigue. There's such a thing as dark fatigue, and I think that what will happen, I think that we're already beginning to see signs of it. I think my, my niece's question to me to begin with was a hint, was an evidence that there is a fatigue of darkness that's beginning to go on in this generation. They're looking around saying, you know what, you've given us nothing to believe in, nothing to hold on to. Now tell it to us straight. What is there? Is this really all there is? Or is there something more than that? I believe they're going to be demanding that. And I hope and pray that they do for my son's sake and for your children's sake and grandchildren's sake, for the future's sake. I'm praying that that moment of awakening will come. But now I'm getting down to what I really wanted to talk to you about. What I really wanted to say to you this morning is that if that's to happen, if we're going to see an awakening, if we're going to see heaven's righteous address to the darkness, there are going to be some costs involved in that. There are some costs to make that happen that simply must be paid. And those are costs that are broken up in some different ways. Can I tell you, first of all, that there is an extreme cost to God Himself. It costs God a great deal to bring an awakening to culture. But the good news I have for you is that God has already paid His part. What God accomplished at Calvary in the death of His Son has been more than enough. Hallelujah! Has been more than enough to do all the spiritual good in this world that this world will ever need. The blood that he shed was sufficient to save, to change, to radically transform every man, woman, boy, and girl who would ever, ever, ever live. But what I'm saying to you is that if there's to be an awakening to come, God hadn't held out his part on us. You hear what I'm saying to you? God has not withheld the part that he was supposed to chip in. God paid his first. Amen? Amen. Can I tell you that there's another cost? And it's a cost I'm excited about. It's a cost that I have a little bit of fun thinking about. And I'm talking about the cost. What an awakening. What a genuine heaven sent awakening. What would that cost the old devil himself? Praise be to God. I hope it's a lot. Amen. 
Can, can you just imagine with me what a radical change well, if we had a generation that started to rise up and say, we're looking for something more, uh, more firm than what we've been given to believe in? We're looking for something that is more than just random chance in this world, but we're looking for something spiritual to build our lives on, and we're going to start with Christ of Nazareth? Can you imagine what that would cost the enemy himself? I am ready. After all the destruction that I have seen him bring to people's lives, all the, all the, the folks who have, have been utterly laid low, I am ready for him to have to pay a price that comes with that. Aren't you? Aren't you? Can't you just imagine that it would feel like a, a little precursor to hell for him? He'd feel the heat in it that speaks of a lake of fire that's just waiting. Amen. Can I tell you that it's more than that? It's also a cost to the world in general. The cost to the world in general and the cost of the world is a sickness over sin. A sickness over sin. I believe the world's getting sick of sin. Believe it or not, Believe it or not, I'm looking at a world and I think that people are getting sick. The same kind of sickness that some folks have when they've drank too much. I know we Church of God people would define too much different than the world would define it. But when they, they are paying the price the next day for it. Or when the glutton has that nausea that comes from overindulgence. I think the world is becoming a little nauseated. With what it's done to itself. I really do believe that. I'm beginning to see that. I don't think they know what to do with it. I don't think they know what to do about it at all. But I think that they're at least getting sick of it. I think that's part of what's driving all these things that we've been talking about. They're getting tired of it. My friend Dennis Creech. Likes to tell a story. He, he, he's from up in Breathitt County. He's pastored all over Kentucky. But he, uh, he's from up in Breathitt County. Any of y'all been to Breathitt County, Kentucky? No, oh, all right. <laughs> different breed of people up there, wonderful people, but they operate on their own way of doing things. That's all right. God bless them. He said he pulled up in his daddy's driveway in Breathitt County, and his brother was there, and his brother had a big 55-gallon drum just pushing it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the yard. And he finally looked at him and said, man, what are you doing with that? What do you got in that thing anyway? He said, I got, my, he said, I got my, uh, one of my hounds in here. You got what in there? He said, I got one of my, one of my coon hounds in here. He said, I put it in here. He said, well, why are you doing that? He said, I found this old deer carcass down the road. It had been hit two, three days ago. It was really getting right. You know what I'm saying? It had swelled up, covered up with all kind of nastiness, stunk to the high heavens. He said, I put it in my, in my dog in this 55-gallon drum, and I'm pushing it back and forth in my yard. He said, why are you doing that? He said, because he's been running deer lately. And he said, I'm going to break him of it. He said, I'm going to do this for about 30 minutes, and when he comes out of there, he ain't going to want to have nothing to do with a deer for the rest of his life. And I tell you, I believe that in some ways the world is getting tired. It has found the end of the pleasurable season of sin. And I believe that we're, we're coming on to a time that is just prime for, for an awakening to come. I believe the world is already paying its part of the price in the devastation that it has to live with. Leaves one more category of payment that must be made. And that is what an awakening will cost the church. And this is the variable. And when I mean the variable, the title I had written on the top of my message here was an awakening to come followed by a question mark. And I want to tell you why the question mark is there. It's right here. This is the question mark. This is the variable that I really can't stand before you and answer with any degree of certainty. The thing I'm not sure about is whether God's people, believe it or not, I'm really not sure whether God's church will be willing to pay the price needful for it to pay Hear me now, needful for it to pay for an awakening to come to rescue my children's generation. I'm just not sure we'll do it. And that's concerning to me. That's concerning to me. You say, well, if you're going to talk like that, you better lay it out for us. What's it going to cost us? What are we talking about? You and I are to be used of God. You see, every time God has brought an awakening, God has used His church to be the catalyst for it. He's used His church like the pilot light by which the rest of the furnace was lit. Amen? The question is, can He use us today? Can He use us today? Will the church pay its part? What will it cost? That awful, terrible, awful word that we hate so bad. It may cost us some change. 
I get a head nod or two, one amen. That's about what I figured. <laughs> so it may cost us. It may cost us a little bit of change somewhere along the way. But here's the problem with that. Let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, it's just us here today, right? Well, let's just be honest with ourselves for a moment. The truth is that the modern church, I'm not talking about necessarily right here in Newark, Ohio, but I'm talking about the church in general across our country. No doubt you're a, a better breed of people, but, but uh, the truth is that the church in general fears change more than it fears failure. I'm going to say that one more time. I want you to hear it this time. The truth is that the church in general fail, fears, fears change more than it fears failure. And there's a problem with that. The problem with that is in this, that the failure we're talking about is a failure to complete our commission. And our commission has not been something that was developed in a committee meeting somewhere, but our commission is handed down to us by God the Father, through Christ the Son, empowered within us by God the Holy Spirit. And so when I say to you that maybe at some points along the way, we've been more afraid of changing than we have of failing, that really ultimately translates to this. We're more afraid of change than we are of God. Right? More afraid of doing anything different than we've always done it than we are of disappointing our Heavenly Father. And that's a big, a big, big problem. One of the things that I've been saying, and, and, and I, I don't like talking like this. i got to be honest with you. I don't like saying these things. Why? Because the truth is, I don't like change either. I like doing my thing my way and calling it consecrated, sacred, blessed, and ordained of God all the time. Just like you, right? We're all just like that. My way is the best way. It's the way I'm sure God is most pleased with of all the earth. So I've been, I've been challenged in some things. I've been preaching these things at home. We have to begin to be people who can discern some differences. We're going to have to learn how to discern some differences between what is sacred tradition and what is only preferential tradition. I want to say that again. I want you to think through what I'm saying to you. We need to be able to discern the difference between what is sacred tradition and what is only our preferential tradition. We have some sacred traditions that come to us through the word of God, right? And those things are, I'm not talking about changing those things, but don't you go trying to put everything in that category either. Not everything belongs there. Some things belong in the category, just, just, I just like it that way. Amen? A fella came into the funeral home the other day, businessman in town. I was there working in the funeral home and he sat down and he said, yeah, you're a preacher. I know you're a preacher. So I want to tell you everything that's wrong with my preacher. And I thought, well, I can't imagine a better thing to do with my day than this. And I started to say, you know what, just, why don't we just pray for him? But before I could get that out of my mouth, he'd already launched into it. And it seemed practiced enough. I was pretty sure he'd said it a few times to a few people. And he said, the problem with the man is that he's got no respect for our traditions. And by itself, I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe he's got something here worth, you know, worth saying, whether he needs to be saying it to me or not. Maybe he just need to talk to the Lord about it. But he went on and he said, he said, his whole thing his whole priority for our whole church is to like have the Holy Spirit come in and move among us. And he said, and he's willing to sacrifice our sacred traditions to do that. And I thought, I wonder if he really sacrifices sacred tradition or just sacrifices your preference. And he, I kind of, I kind of asked him to elaborate. And you know what I found? I was exactly right. I was exactly right. And he said, now, don't get me wrong. Now, listen to this. This is a man who sits on the board of a church. Has for decades. Has for decades before he even professed to be a Christian. That's part of the problem. Right? But he said, he said, here's, here's the thing. He said, don't get me wrong. He said, I believe that we ought to honor the Holy Spirit. But I think our traditions are even more important than that. I finally got to the point where I had to hold up my hand. Said, I'm afraid that if I sit here and listen any longer, that you'll get up you'll all of a sudden and walk away thinking that I have agreed with you. And I need you to walk away from this understanding that I can't tell you how much I disagree with you. <laughs> right? If your traditions are standing in the way of the Holy Spirit, that's a problem. A bigger problem is that you think they should. Right? 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 
And so I said, listen, you need to understand the difference between those things, what is sacred tradition. And, you know, I always am amused at the people who, Lord, if you sang a song that was written after 1950 in church, they would, they would just die over that. Oh, and I, yeah, I'm not trying to come here and start a music war with anybody. I promise you that. But, 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 but here's the thing. They will stand on our tradition, and yet we have a foot washing. Do they ever show up for that? No. I mean, you know, it's, it's the ones who say we have to honor our tradition. But when we do something that is sacred, born of the Word of God, it's like, well, brother, I just don't feel it today. I'm not going to be there. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't discern the difference. I've talked about that long enough. Let me go. One is born from the Word. One is born of our own selfishness. That's all I'll say about that. We need to be able to, will, to be willing, rather, to come to the end of business as usual in the church. That's what it's going to cost us, an end to business as usual. It seems that God in these days has gone to extraordinary lengths. Hear me now. He's gone to extraordinary lengths to kick us out of our routines. Now, the church that I pastor in Clay City is still meeting in its parking lot. I'm not telling you I think there's anything wrong with us being in here. But we're still meeting in our parking lot. And about right now, my youth pastor is standing up on our hay wagon to preach. So parking lot of people sitting in their cars listening by way of FM radio, right? Are we out of our routine? Most certainly we are. Is it absolutely the work of the devil that we're out of our routine? Friend, I'm more suspicious that maybe it's the work of God. No, no resonance. Okay. Um, I got you. Um, he's gone to great lengths to knock us out of our business as usual mindset. And people keep like they're obsessively asking me two questions over and over again. And taken on their own, they're interesting enough. Taken together, they really speak to the heart that we have. People keep coming. And, and, and there for a while, it was just this one question. They say, how long, how long till we get things back to normal? Right? How long till I go sit in my pew again and threaten anybody that tries to sit in it with me? You know, how long? How long until we're back to doing church our way that we're used to again? Right? We want to get back to that just as, as quick as we can. And, and I, all I could say is, you know, guys, I'm... I'm I'm not in charge of the pandemic. I don't know who you're going to blame that on. You blame it on the devil, blame it on God. Just don't blame it on me, right? You know, I don't know when this will happen. I don't know when we'll get back into that. And so they got tired of asking that question, I guess, after a while. And they finally started asking me this question. Pastor, do you believe that we're seeing the end of time? And so I, 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 I started answering that question just saying, yes, and trying to walk away. And that, are we in the last days? Yes. And then I always stop and say, but then we have been since Christ went into heaven, right? Uh, we've been in the last days ever since. Why can't you get this? You know what I'm saying? Why do we always obsess about that question? Ask and answer it already. Already. God, who at various times and in diverse manners spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. Yes. And they, well, that's, brother, that's not what we mean. I know it's not what you mean. You want to know if he's coming next Tuesday. Right. And, and, and what I'm what I'm seeing in that, and I had to challenge a few people with that is, is when you're asking me obsessively two questions, when do things get back to normal? Is Christ coming next week? What you're really saying is, God, look here, we want to do it our way or we want to get out of here. Don't expect us to be any different. If we don't get back to business as usual, we might as well just be in glory because we can go do nothing else. Maybe the reason we're still in our parking lot is because God is just being stubborn with us and saying, I'm going to teach you some things about how to have to be different. I think we're going to have to abandon a business as usual mindset. I think we're going to have to develop. Listen to me now. We can say this is the case, but it is not the case for the church at large. I can't stand here, look out at this, at this crowd today or up into that balcony up there, and I can't know this about any one of you but I don't think it takes a great deal of spiritual discernment to look at the church at large today and see the truth in this. We just don't have a very passionate hunger that refuses to be satisfied with anything less than the presence of God. I was reading this. This may seem like a strange connection to make. It probably is. It's probably ill-advised. I shouldn't use it, but I'm going to. I was reading uh, this week about... In, in Genesis, when God sent the two angels to rescue Lot from Sodom. 
You remember that? How when they came into the city, Lot said, you have to go home with me and don't be out here after dark. And he took them to his house and the darkness came and then what happened? With a great hunger. Hear me now. With a great carnal hunger, the men of that city came for those men. And they said, we will not be satisfied until you have given them to us. Right? Hear, hear what I'm saying to you. The, the application I'm trying to draw out of that is this. Those men of Sodom in their carnality had a greater hunger for, for sin than what the people of God today in general seem to have for the presence of God. We ought to be just as determined. We have camped out, Lord God, and we have said we will not be satisfied. We will not go away until you have brought forth your presence and you've just lived among us. We need the presence of God more than we need any other thing. We need the presence of God more than we need our own routines and our own. We need the presence of God more than we need air to breathe. And God, we won't be satisfied with anything less than that. God, we're ready to be hungry. What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They shall be filled. Amen. Amen. We need a renewed commitment to genuine discipleship. Somewhere, forgive me, this isn't a universal absolute, but it is generally true. Within God's church today, we've stopped being students of the word. Hear me now. We've stopped being students of the word and we've become consumers of Christian media. Right? We don't really, really, really dig into the word of God. But every time something pops up on our Facebook that says, if you love Jesus, this you'll forward this on to 10 of your friends and God will bless you. Hey, I'm on it because I want Jesus to know I'm a good guy. I'm on his side. Hey, you, you know, I mean, come on, come on, come on. Right. The day of discipleship must come. We're going to have to get this thing figured out. We're going to have to get back to saying, God, I want to be discipled and I want to be a discipler. Something strange has happened in Clay City in the church that I pastor or outside the church. I don't know how to say it anymore. I had a couple of young men who came to me about two months ago. One of them in particular comes to my mind. He said this to me. He said, Brother Brad, I have decided that I'm going to be a Christian. You know this. I've talked to you about this. You've baptized me as a believer. But I have come to this point where I'm going to say this. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And he said, I realize I need, I need a strong foundation from the Word of God. Can you help me build it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, absolutely. Nothing would thrill me more than to help you to be discipled like that. So we looked at some times and I said, hey, you know what? We're not meeting. Our church isn't meeting on Sunday nights right now because of all this going on. And so we picked out that time frame and he comes over about five o'clock on Sunday evenings. And we sit out in my garage and we I call it table, table saw theology because we sit around my big table saw in my garage and we. And we open our Bibles and we've been studying the covenants of God. And can I tell you something that, that not only is that doing a thing in him, that's doing a thing in this pastor's heart. You say, oh, but man, when we get back to having business as usual, get back to having church, I dread it. Can I be honest enough with you? I'm far enough away from home to be honest. Can I be honest enough with you to say that I would a thousand times rather be sitting around the table saw talking about the scripture with somebody who is hungry for it on a Sunday night than in a church, than in a church with people who are there only out of obligation? I'd much rather be sharing in the word with somebody who says, feed it to me because I want it. And trying to tamp it into people who. I don't know. I don't know. We're going to have to get back to genuine Get genuine discipleship, students of the word, not just consumers of Christian media. Oh, my goodness. When it comes to the things that we'll listen to, we'll believe in. We are the most gullible people in the world. You know what I'm saying? The forces that work around us in this world who will manipulate us. I'm talking about us specifically as Christians. Us specifically because of our association with one another and what it's assumed that we will believe or buy into. Constantly manipulated. Let me tell you what, you and I cannot afford to be divorced from the Word of God in this day. Listen to that. Hear that. Amen. Having our whole lives shaped by the teaching of Jesus. This is where we come down to. Are we that? Are we not that? <laughs> remember, remember what happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up? All these people were confused. What in the world is going on here? All these people preaching. We're hearing them in all these languages, but there are languages that we were born in. What in the world is going on? And Peter stood up and he said, this is that which was prophesied. This is that 
But I have to ask the question, is this that? Is this what we're seeing in today's modern church? Is that what, what it's about? Can I, can I tell you that it seems like so many professing Christians today, they don't look like they've actually ever even read the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not trying to be hard to any of you all today, but I'm, I'm asking this. Are, are we being shaped in how we live and how we love by the example and by the teaching of Christ? Amen. Because here's the thing. There is an incredible amount of darkness in the world. And I believe with all my heart that God intends to bring an awakening. God intends to bring an explosion of light in answer to those things. But that will not happen unless all the costs are paid. And God has paid His price. The world is paying its. Satan will pay his. Will you and I pay ours? Are we going to get down to the things that really matter? Are we willing to simplify it and strip it down to bare bones and say, this is what it means for me to be a Christian and this is what it means for us to be the church. Cleansed of all those things that have, have distracted. We've lost some things along the way. Modern church has forgotten even how to simply be kind. Right? Right? Talk about a world full of darkness where people wrangle and devour one another. Christians will fight with you as soon as anybody else in the world will today. Right? They'll fight and go to war. There's social media warriors everywhere, right? And I'm just thinking, oh, please. I told a pastor friend of mine a few years ago, right when Facebook was becoming a thing, he said, you know, I'm thinking about getting a Facebook account. I said, uh -huh. I said here's the good thing about, about Facebook. I said, you see your people as they really are. I said, here's the bad thing about Facebook is you see your people as they really are, right? And you see the things that they say to people. And then the next one, they say, come follow me to church at Clay City First Church. Like, oh, no, please. Don't tell them I'm your pastor. Because you're mean, right? Because you're just mean people. Because you just like to fight and argue and they'll think I told you that. Right? Right? Can I tell you, friends? Can I tell you? We're going to have to get back on message. My, look at my kids. There, there are other kids here their age and, and, and a little older, a little younger. They're part of the generation that's been utterly deprived of a spiritual foundation. They are being lost. They're being lost in mass. They're killing themselves for want of anything to believe in. Right? Right? Surely you and I can remember... That we are bearers of the light. Surely you and I can remember that it was to us that the gospel of Christ has been entrusted. And that light is the true answer to the darkness. It is the thing for which they grope. Surely you and I can come back and say, God set it before us to be back on message. Quit playing stupid political games with, with the world around us. Quit talking about your political party so much. Quit talking about the candidate that you like so much. Quit talking about the one that you don't like so much. Why don't we talk about Jesus? Why don't we keep the focus on Him and Him alone? Why don't we be like... Paul who said, I seek to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Amen. We need to get back on message. Isaiah 60. I was going to preach on that, wasn't I? I promise I'm just about done. Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. That little, what we call the second person, personal pronoun. That is you or your. Notice the times that it appears as we read through this again. These three verses. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come. That is, the unbelievers shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Can I ask you what the antecedent of that pronoun is? To whom does he refer when he says the glory of the Lord is risen upon you? To whom does he refer when he says the unbelievers will come to your light? They'll be mesmerized by your rising. Can I ask you who he's talking about? You say, oh, I know this one, brother. It's Jesus. No, it's not. He's talking to the people of God. Listen to me. He's talking to me and to you, right? You and I have the power to be the catalyst 
for an awakening, amen, for the darkness to be pushed back. The Bible says over in the book of 1 John, it says something like this. It says the true light has come into the world and the darkness is passing away. Is that the word of God or is it not? Can I tell you that the darkness we see in its grim depths, in the stranglehold, what really is happening here, it is the death throes of the darkness because the true light is already shining in the world. And you have that light if you have Christ. Will you and I pay the needful cost? Will we be awakened out of our slumber? Will we forget about business as usual? Will we get out there to meet the world and the Lord together and say, God, let us just be the catalyst for the awakening to come. My niece needs some answers to her questions. She needs people who will meet her. Her friends need people who will meet them. My sons will need people to meet them, to encourage them that the foundations of our faith are sure and they're steadfast. The great variable and the reason I put a question mark there at all is this. I just don't know for sure if we will do it. I wonder if you'd let yourself weep before the Lord. I wonder if you'd let yourself just join me in just saying, God, I, the darkness of these days is deep. But God, give us wisdom to discern the times that we live in and to discern what our response ought to be. How our hearts ought to be changed. How our spirits ought to be broken. How our routines ought to be disrupted. I think God is proving himself the God of the disruption right now. I'm willing to embrace it. Are you? Are you? I want to pay whatever cost is needful. I don't have to look too far to see why. It's my children. It's yours. Come on. If you really believe what you just heard, if you really want to push the darker pea back, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to pray and we've got to get ourselves in shape to pray. Sherm's going to sing. This church needs to pray. 145 I hear the Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all Listen, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. So I'm just going to sing another verse. If you really want to change the way that God wants to change you, start it with prayer. We're not going to push any darkness back. And we're not going to have the power to say to any demons, demons be gone. Until we fix what's wrong in our lives. Some are saturated with the world. Some are entangled in the world. And if you really want to make a difference, I'm talking to the churches, the churches that are listening online. This was one of the best, if not the best, opening camp meeting sermon that I have ever heard. 
And he lived up to what's behind me, those words. So as we sing another verse, God bless you. That man he was talking about, he was afraid of conviction. He was afraid of the Holy Spirit knocking on his heart's door. And there's no greater experience than having God trying to open our hearts. So God bless you as we sing one more verse. I know it's late. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's heart and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. many appreciated the message this morning? Amen. How many felt like you were really in church today? Amen. Amen. God bless you. A couple announcements will let you go. The sanctuary will be closed for sanitation right after the services. No entry until the doors are opened. So when you vacate, please vacate quietly. Head for the dining hall. Main dining hall will be closed after the meal for sanitation. Small dining hall will remain open until 4.30. No entry until the next meal. And the balcony and far right pews over here reserved for those participating in social distancing. Some of you sit up there naturally all the time. You're welcome to do that. Okay, with that said, you're all dismissed in the name of the Lord.